But uh, yeah, and I'm gonna let Ashton take control of this next segment because uh, you know I, I saw it and I was like, oh, can't gloss over that because I know how much he loved it. We have uh, Mick Foley dressed as Santa Claus. I loved this segment. <laughs> and you know what? I'm not even like I. Uh, most of our viewers are well aware that I'm not a very religious person at all. Um, I loved this segment, not because it was Christmas, but because it was Mick Foley doing what he loves best. He is about as much of a mark for Santa Claus as John is for John Morrison. Like Mick Foley, and, and I would actually say more so, because Mick Foley revolves his life around Christmas and Santa Claus. And he even said when he was on Raw that this is like the 200 and some odd day that he had worn a Santa-related outfit or shirt or something like he is obsessed and the fact that the wwe was like hey mick how would you like to be santa claus i just imagine the way that phone call went down he probably like the 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 tone of his voice probably went up five octaves that day it's just awesome to think about and the fact that not only was it him it was him and his daughter and then you realize it's all the slow burn because his daughter's name is noel how perfect is that for this kind of promo? You're talking. I mean, I've read two of Mick Foley's autobiographies, and, and That's this guy two more than I've read. So congratulations. And this guy is so obsessed with Christmas, and I'm actually glad about that because maybe I'll let you in on something that maybe you didn't know, but I'm sure you did because LOL Internet. Um, this guy has a room dedicated to Christmas year round. Like, you know what? I might have heard that before, but I wouldn't have thought to bring it up. So good on you. Yeah, like, that's how much this guy loves it, which is why, for all the times, all the years that WWE has done WWEshop.com segments revolving around Christmas, my personal favorites, because I know you mentioned uh, one of yours outside of this, Ash, and I forget which one that was. Oh, oh, no, it was one of the angles you said, not shop segments. It was Good Santa versus Bad Santa, Sandow versus Mark Henry. Was that um, last year or the year before? I believe that was last year. Because that was the, – and the angle, I thought, was awful. But the match itself was hilarious. Yeah, that match was terrific. And that was one of the few times the commentary was really on point. Yeah, that was JBL's peak, I think. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of my favorite WWE shop, uh, dot com segments for Christmas was the DX ones where they were showing the toys. But this was fantastic. And you know what? what's great, too, is that his daughter, Noel, which the name, of course, as you said, Ashton, was so apropos for the time of year – but I, I've been hearing rumblings that she may be wanting to try her hand at NXT. Yeah, I so, mean, she, well, I don't know if it's likely to happen, but she's said multiple times now that she would love to be a diva. Right. So, so it's really so, just a matter of if she would be willing to put the work in to become one. Although, yeah. then again, the fact that the Bella Twins are divas, apparently there's not that much work that goes into it, but you'll see. But I guess I guess they want women to put more work in that, which is great. Which is great, so I would love yeah, to see you I try mean, your hand at it. I, I would much rather have more AJ Lees in our world than Kelly Kelly's. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and then we get to, I mean, I'm not going to speak for Ashen here. This is my favorite segment of the night. Because we go to WWE. Oh, yeah, the Paul Heyman thing, yeah. The this was... freaking Paul Heyman thing. You're damn right it was. <laughs> because, you know what? I'll even admit that I've kind of fallen into that a little bit. Like, I, I'm no saint in this regard, okay? But I've heard a lot of people very recently complain, oh, where's Lesnar? I can't believe we have to go to the Rumble without a title defense. And again, I joined that mob a little bit because I'm like, yeah, it is a little long. But mainly because, like, I love Brock. I love watching him destroy people. I love the idea that he's our champion. I, I think, if anything, it's just that I'm being selfish and I don't get enough Brock in my life right now. But Heyman turns this around. Because, you know, Cena kind of encapsulates our sentiments by saying, oh, Brock only shows up once a year. <laughs> Rock promos all over again. And, and Heyman says, well, let me ask you guys something. What if it was Christmas every day? What if it was WrestleMania 365 days? Well, I think he said every Monday. Every Monday was must-see because it was WrestleMania. And he comes right out and he says, that would be stupid because it would lose the wonder. It would lose the power that it has only being once a year pretty much saying special it would stop being special and that's pretty much where he transitions into lesnar because he says you know brock lesnar is must see television he isn't just some performer he is a legitimate attraction and uh you know he says cena 
if he is able to hold on to his number one contendership, you know, will receive a beating like no other. And then, you know, Heyman starts to speculate, you know, who will be the number one contender if Cena loses his match to Seth Rollins? Will it be Seth Rollins, the guy who curb stomped Brock Lesnar? And Heyman mentions how the authority can't protect Seth anymore. An important thing to note here, he says, and now, you know, with all that out of the way, let it be noted that the apology that I accepted from Seth uh, Rollins, consider that acceptance rescinded. I so. love it, dude. I Because the only reason that he ever let Rollins get away with that in the first place was because the authority and he had a working agreement. And now the authority's out, so screw Rollins. Exactly. I, I, Heyman is such a slime bag. And especially I because they made it abundantly clear that Rollins acted on his own. Exactly. Exactly. So Heyman, I mean, the, the saltiness never went away. He was only doing a courtesy to the authority. And now that that's done, it's like, hey, Rollins, remember when we did that thing? Yeah, that that's no longer relevant. You're, you're on our hit list. Yeah. Um, which, I, again, love it. Absolutely love it. He says, uh, how about The Undertaker? You know, that would be great. You know, great, great rematch there, and it would just be the same as last time. And then uh, the, probably the best line in the whole thing. He says, um, how about Sting? Because he, he does make a transition. He says something about Undertaker and how I guess that beating would sting or taking out the sting of his WrestleMania loss. And he says, well, hey, how about Sting? And you wouldn't even have to bill it as a retirement match because if he, if he steps in the ring with Brock Lesnar, you can guarantee that it would be a retirement match. He would never step in the ring again. Love that. Yep. And then he closes with, how about the entire WWE locker room? Make the whole locker room number one contender. Brock Lesnar will eat them up, spit them out one by one, and dominate. Uh, just like, uh, you know, the, the, they can bring any Roman gladiator up to Brock Lesnar. I like the use of Roman there. Maybe just a very subtle tease. And uh, Brock Lesnar. Brock, yeah, Brock Lesnar would be like the lion feeding on them. And, and see, this is why I, I don't want to speak for you, Ashton, but I, I'm just going to say generally, this is why we love Paul Heyman. Because things I'm waiting like, for Roman Reigns to come back and be like, they didn't need a Roman gladiator to take down Brock Lesnar. They just needed a Roman Reigns. <laughs> Does he put on the sunglasses before he says Reigns? <laughs> yes. Then perfect. And then, uh, yeah! The music <laughs> <plays>. <laughs> oh, that should be his new gimmick. How many ways can I work my name into a promo? <laughs> well, that's basically going to be his gimmick. It's just going to be way less, like, way less uh, nuanced than what I just did. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know what? Again, I, I was getting ready to say this is why we love Paul Heyman. Yeah. Because criticisms like this could fly at Lesnar's face. Who knows how often it flies at the product, this and the other. And Heyman pretty much tells you, in the most brilliant way possible, shut up and sit down. Like, just just watch the product and know that my client isn't just some monkey you can throw peanuts at and have him dance for your amusement. He is an attraction. You're going to pay to see that attraction. And when you see him, you know that it's not just going to be something to, to kill time. Something to fill up space. Can I just say this, John? Attraction. Yeah. This WWE is how you build a star. Yeah. I don't even care that he's already relatively established. The fact that Paul Heyman is calling him an attraction, he's only showing up every couple months. He showed up at two pay-per-views in a row. You can't take that away from him. And then he took off a three-month hiatus. And then he's going to show up at Rumble. He may or may not wrestle it at Fastlane. I kind of doubt it. And then he's going to be at Mania. This is how you make somebody into a star. You tell people that they're a star. You tell people that they're an attraction. And then you withhold them. And by withholding Brock Lesnar, the WWE has made it so that any show that he is even advertised for is going to be an instant sellout because people want to be there when Lesnar shows up. Absolutely. I mean, this may not be the best example to substantiate your point, but when I was a kid and the big angle going on, you know, when Raw and SmackDown were actually supposed to be internally competitive brands because Vince won a competition, Eric was leading Raw, Stephanie was leading SmackDown, and the big angle was, who's going to sign Scott Steiner? 
and they made it the biggest deal in the world. Now, keep in mind, of course, me being my age, no idea about his prior history, no idea about WCW, but we didn't see him compete in a match. We saw him maybe beat down a guy here or there. But the big stink was, who's going to get the signing? And then at that point, like, everybody was so excited that he came to Raw, and he just immediately got a world title match against Triple H. Like, there was legitimate excitement there. And I agree with you. That's how you build a guy up. When you make it seem like all of this hype is so real. But here's the biggest difference, and I'm, that actually makes me glad I brought up that example, between Steiner and Lesnar. Because when Steiner finally had his match, it was the shits. All right, it, it was absolutely awful. When Lesnar shows up or has a manager does a beatdown, you're getting your money's worth. Yep. I, I mean, the guy backs it up, okay? Yeah. And I'm really, I wonder how much this absence is going to play into the next match because they could go with the gimmick that the reason Lesnar takes time off is to make sure that he's 100% for his next match and that the reason Cena got so close to beating him at Night of Champions is because he only had a couple weeks to to prepare for that match and that's way it's not enough time for Lesnar to prepare so when he's finally at 100% like are they going to have him go over Cena in a similar way to the way he went over him at SummerSlam because of the fact that he's had time to recover and prepare Oh, man, I hope so. Because really, Night of Champions... Well, I mean, everyone and their mother is going to be hoping... Well, I shouldn't say mother, because middle-aged women tend to love John Cena. But everyone and their brother, I should say, is hoping that, that Lesnar's going to win. But it's it's not a matter of whether want people want it to happen. It's a matter of whether the WWE is going to let it happen. Well, I, I mean, that... I mean, you could speculate about that till the cows come home. I mean, I'm going to assume no. I'm going to assume it's going to be a very competitive matchup. Uh, but, again, I would love to see Cena get squashed. And I think you, we'd have a perfectly logical basis. Like, oh, look at me. I've had all this time to rest up and train. And, really, it also makes logical sense because it's not like Cena's been resting on his laurels. You know, he, he was just at the Survivor Series part of this really big match. And now he's got a tables match. Even if he wins that, you'd have to imagine that kayfabe-wise, he's going to be coming in with some lingering injuries. Yep. So, you know, like, it all comes together where what you're saying makes perfect sense. But it's John Cena and WWE booking, so what good does sense do you? Yeah. To me, the best thing about this is that we know for a fact that John Cena won't be winning the Royal Rumble because he's already got a match at Rumble. Yeah. There you go. That's I fine. mean, John Cena mini might win the Royal Rumble, a.k.a. Roman Reigns, but as long as it's not Cena. <laughs> 